Warriors open the season with a bunch of familiar faces and a lot of new ones playing key roles. Let's preview Matt Painter and the Boilermakers on Gold and Black Radio. Kyle Charters here with Brian Newbert. Uh, first things first, Brian, uh, we've made the transition over to On3 at goldandblack.com. I think this is the first podcast to drop in the new home. Certainly uh, some exciting times here during the transition. Yeah, it's, it's not just the first podcast. It's one of the first content items. Um, <laughs> but yeah, after uh, after a couple of decades uh, with Rivals.com, uh, a great run. We've moved GoldenBlack.com over to the On3 network. Uh, we did not make this decision lightly. Uh, we don't think our users will find much of a disruption, if at all. Uh, I think this gives us the best possibility to put out the best product we possibly can. Uh, it's as simple as that. I think, you know, the people who who founded on three and and run on three are typically at the forefront of every major innovation our industry has ever seen. And as the landscape of college sports and the media change, uh, we figured that was a good side for us to be on. So our existing users can go to our site right now, goldenblack.com's URL uh, still works um, and get the first year for only a dollar that's four quarters 10 dimes 100 pennies <laughs> uh 20 nickels um that's uh no matter what you think of my work one dollar <laughs> for 12 months is is uh you know a relatively minor investment so we did not take it lightly that we have you know kind of kind of disrupted people's routine in some ways but um we do think it'll be a worthwhile transition, not only for us, but for our users. Yeah. One dollar for your work. Yeah. Two dollars. Yeah, yeah. We're getting a little iffy there. <laughs> I was going to value it around 78 cents, but um, <laughs> I guess that's kind of a big ask. Round up. All right. So exciting. Uh, certainly I'm looking forward as usual to uh, all the work that, that you and, and Tom Dean Hart, and Alan Carpet do. Uh, the, the personalities and the work stays the same. Different platform that'll provide some technological advances. Uh, I would imagine it's uh, pretty exciting. Well, I do want to mention that the message board platform is almost identical. Uh, and that's huge because what we did not want to do was we did not want to force our users the people who've allowed us to become part of their lives um, to really have to adjust to a new sort of uh, platform. Uh, I understand that can be, that can be a difficult transition uh, for a lot of people's routines. It would be for me. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm horrified of the black magic of technology, um, but I, I don't think people will notice much of a difference from a message board use perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's kind of all that matters in terms of the day-to-day -day functionality of our site. Um, so we will be a little bit more, uh, I'm not sure what the word I'm looking for here is. I, I think it was important for us, it's important, I'm speaking for myself here, it was important for me you know, to really start to get pushed again. I thought, you know, uh, after a very long run of, of running a very successful site i think it's easy you know to get a little bit complacent get a little bit comfortable i think having to acclimate to some things that are changing in our industry uh being forced to have to acclimate to those things instead of having just to come to it on your own i think that's going to be a very positive thing for me uh personally i think that'll be a very positive thing for our whole staff i think it will it'll put us a little bit more on the cutting edge it will it will motivate us it will it will uh it will ultimately make for a better product. And that's the end goal here because our loyalty lies with our users, our readers, our, our listeners, our viewers, um, all the people, once again, who have allowed us to become part of their daily routines, part of their lives, and uh, part of our community. All right, let's jump in and talk a little bit of basketball and, and this team. Um, you know, as I said in the open, Brian, it, it is interesting that, this team has some familiarity. Um, it's not like it's going to be Illinois or Ohio State of this year, which the Fighting Illini and the Buckeyes might have good teams, but if they do so, they're going to be very different teams than what we have seen in the last few years from them with Purdue. There are a lot of familiar names, faces back, but also some new ones who are playing some key roles. It is a an interesting mix here, I think, for Matt Painter as he tries to put this team together. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you know produce as familiar as 
a lot of past Purdue teams. I think when you look at the when you look at the number of guys on this team who are playing the same role, basically uh, they played last year. I think it's a two guy list. I think it's 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 Zach Eady and it's Mason Gillis. Outside of that, it's it's a veritable cast of thousands of guys who are either new or moving into much larger, much more expansive roles, and that brings with it uh, not only some some uncertainty uh, but some intrigue, some some excitement. You know, I, I keep mentioning this, and it, it may not be the the best example because I think that the team I'm about to reference kind of captured some lightning in a bottle there. Uh, and is built very differently. But I think the last time Purdue overhauled like this, um, well, the last two times Purdue overhauled like this, the first one was 2019 when that team was built around Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein and that they won the Big Ten and damn near went to the Final Four. And then to a lesser extent, during the pandemic, the freshman year when Edie and Jaden Ivey and all those guys were freshmen, uh, you know, Purdue went on to have a very good year. So just because a team is new, that doesn't put a ceiling on what they can do. Uh, that rhymes. That was that was pretty good, Sam. I am. Um, I do not like green eggs and ham. New uh, anyway, here, new feature here in the new new site. Uh, Brian has <laughs> got Doctor Doctor Seuss in the Limericks <laughs> with Newbert. Um, no, I, I I I just think what's so interesting about this season is just how does Ethan Morton handle you know, going from that sort of plug and play sort of whatever you need, Swiss army knife guy, you pull out of the kitchen drawer when you need him to being a 28 minute guy uh, over maybe a more defined role. How does his productivity translate to a larger role? How does Brandon Newman, you know, handle the role that Matt Painter's always said he's better in than coming off the bench and playing minimal minutes uh, now, if he is the guy who Purdue is going to rely on as much as, a lot of us have figured they'd they'd probably rely on him. Even if that's 18 to 20 minutes a game, they're still relying on him. How does Zach Eady handle yeah. you know going from that 50-50 timeshare with with Travion Williams the last couple of years to being the unquestioned, you know, uh foundational player on this team, both from an offensive perspective, a defensive perspective, an offensive decision making perspective. He's the guy that affects everything now about this team. How does he handle that? How do these freshman guards come in there's nothing more i guess perilous you know for coaches probably um than being young in their backcourt especially in the big 10 and braden smith and fletcher lawyer have yet to play a college game but purdue loves both of them they love both of those guys so for as much as i'm sitting here talking about how much cause for angst that might be the fact they have no experience that's also exciting because you don't know how that's going to turn out. It could also be an absolute home run. And that's happened before too. You look at the Etwan Moores, you look at the Carson Edwards, you look at the Lewis Jacksons. There's a lot of, you look at the Jaden Ivies, the back half of his freshman year. There's a lot of precedent here too for freshman guards coming in and hitting big. And Purdue has had this kind of like guilty look on their face about Braden Smith ever since he enrolled <laughs> in terms of like, they feel like they absolutely stole a star here. And I think, you know, Fletcher Lawyer is right there with them. I, I, I think that Fletcher Lawyer was the guy in that recruiting class they wanted for a very specific reason. And ever since they got him, I think everything they thought he would be, he's been. And then some, those two guys carry themselves in a way that you don't even look at them as freshmen. So there's going to be a lot of questions here about how this team kind of comes together, how roles are defined, things like that. There's probably going to be a process involved. You know, I think Purdue will look very different at the end of the year than they will at the start of the year um, for the better, uh, as opposed to the way it went last year when Purdue looked like the best team in the country in the first two months of the season. And then mm -hmm. obviously uh, some inconsistency followed and a, a uh, memorable flame out ensued. Um but I, I think this will be one of the more interesting seasons Purdue's had. And at this point, I can't even remember your question. There were conversations with Matt Painter and Zach Eady coming up on the podcast as well. Painter has been pretty forthcoming, uh, just as you sort of were saying there, and, and the expectations not being met last season. Not sure what the expectation is on this team, I guess. You know, 
probably about the same for every Purdue team these days. It feels like considering they've made the Sweet 16, what, five out of six seasons or whatever it's been, you know, top five finish in the Big Ten, Sweet 16. Is there a chance, though, that that this team, unlike last year's team, could actually, you know, exceed expectation level? Yeah. Reach a yeah. higher ceiling um, or could push that ceiling a little bit higher maybe than what we feel like it is right now? Yeah, I think this is a much more – uh, I think this is more of a traditional Purdue type of team. I think they'll be maybe a little bit less inclined to beat themselves as much as a team last year did that was maybe a little bit too comfortable trying to just win on talent alone. Uh, you know, maybe got a little casual with things because a lot of stuff came easy to them that's not going to come as easily to this team or is not going to come at all to this team uh, because the ceiling athletically is is not nearly as high. Um, whether this team can overachieve, I guess, kind of kind of depends on where the floor is. I mean, if people are looking at Purdue as like a top four team right now in the Big Ten, I think that's a credit to the benefit of the doubt Matt Painter's earned. Uh, but that's also a, a, a relatively high standard in a really competitive league. But I don't see any reason why Purdue can't, you know, keep on trucking here and, you know, win 20 plus games, be a factor in the Big Ten race, make the NCAA tournament, maybe do some damage there. Uh but when you when you're as new as you are, there's also a wide range of outcomes here. I think the personalities involved with this team, the pieces are good enough. Where I, I think the floor isn't as low as it would be with a lot of new teams. Uh, I, I think they can be very competitive. I think they can be very uh, solid, and that's what kind of Purdue needs more than anything is solid. And I'm saying that about a team that you know very likely may start two freshman guards. Mm-hmm. Um, so assuming. Uh, a team will be steady and solid and all that stuff when you're that young in the backcourt is a big assumption to make. Uh, but I don't see any reason why Purdue can't surprise some people. That's been kind of their MO. I, I referenced those two seasons before, uh, the Carson Edwards junior year, the Jaden Ivey freshman year, uh, where expectations could reasonably have been you know, lower than just about any other season at Purdue, and Purdue exceeded those expectations pretty significantly. Um and both of those years should be fresh in everyone's mind. That's not – I'm not talking about 20 years ago here. I'm not talking about 2007, you know, or uh, whatever it was. Um, when Purdue had all those freshmen, I'm not talking about Matt Painter's third year or second year, whatever it was, when they had all those freshmen. I'm talking about, like, two of the last six years or something like that. So Purdue knows how to do this. Um, all the faces change, but I think – you know, Matt Painter's earned some benefit of the doubt here in terms of his ability to to put together, you know, functional teams with pieces that might not necessarily be ideal, uh, but he's also shown he can kind of figure it out a little bit. Um, he can push the right buttons to get guys to, to buy into the sort of roles that you need them to buy into to, to make for a team that might be better than it looks on paper. And I think the pieces on this team are good enough to where – you don't look at them as like a bag of bolts that is going to have to like really overachieve to have a good year. I, I think it's just going to be a matter of those freshman guards learning on the fly, Zach Eady handling this alpha role, and then guys learning how to play together. And, um, you know, guys knowing how to best make Zach Eady the best player he can be, but also Zach Eady, you know, be – being in a position where he can make the guys around him better too, as the, as the centerpiece of this team, that's sort of the burden that now falls on him too. So there's going to be a process involved with this team, but I don't see any reason why they can't have a pretty standard uh, outcome um, by Purdue standards when all is said and done here. Let's get Matt Painter's thoughts, your conversation with the veteran head coach of the Boilermakers. That's coming up next after this quick break, you're listening to gold and black radio. At Purdue Federal Credit Union, it's about a relationship. A relationship that goes where you go, wherever you are in life. A relationship that's committed to free financial wellness resources, lower fees, and innovative digital banking solutions. Because we believe in people helping people. Let's build your financial future together. Purdue Federal Credit Union, your trusted financial partner for life. 
Federally insured by NCUA. On the far end of Main Street in downtown Lafayette, you'll find East End Grill. Industrial and classic, the restaurant is built like a steakhouse but handles like a bistro. East End Grill's menu includes creative starters, simple chopped salads, burgers, fresh fish, and steaks, and the signature shrimp and grits. The staff prepares every item from scratch and emphasizes simple meals that incorporate fresh, local, and seasonal ingredients. A warm and inviting dining room features a cozy bar that includes a great selection of craft beer, inspired cocktails, and a robust and expanding wine list. Whatever your entertainment needs are, a cocktail at the bar, dinner with family, or a special event at the private dining room, the energized and attentive staff is here for you. East End Grill and Downtown Lafayette, welcome to our table. All right, so just to kind of start off without relitigating last season, what does your team have to get back to what does your program have to kind of get back to you feel like yeah I don't I don't feel like we have to get back to anything um you know I think you have different personnel yeah. and the thing that jumps out to me more than anything was our inability to do our job especially defensively especially play running at times we used to break plays and, and very rarely when we broke plays we'd have any success we'd talk about it we'd watch on film and it just kind of continued. It wasn't a high volume of things, but it was enough to where it'd make a difference, especially in close games. So like a lot of times people want that change. Like what do you need to change? And in, in all reality, you need to be better at what you do, but we have to be better at doing our job. Whatever we decide to do, you know, you've got to have, every, and when you do that, that's where you hear coaches, you know, talk about that connectivity of just sticking together, being together, and that's what you get. You can grow that way when everybody is trying to pull the rope in the same direction. You keep coming back to that same theme of having to be better together. Yes. It kind of sounds like a political slogan, but what does that kind of mean to you as a coach, being better together? Um, well, it's a team sport, obviously, yes. so being better together just allows us to not have any surprises like offensive surprises, bad shots, you know, defensive surprises. If you're supposed to stay tight in a ball screen uh, situation, you stay tight. You don't go under it. Um, there are things in the game of basketball that are in the gray area that are reads. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, tangible things that are matter of fact, and this is what we've decided to do. Being able to do that, that's what really gets that cohesiveness, and that's really gets, you know, us not making – us on having breakdowns a lot of times what happens in basketball is people make plays after breakdowns make people make plays without breakdowns make them score over you don't give them angles things of that nature and then just our transition defense wasn't very good because we put ourselves in tough minds we had the tough shot or we had the turnover you know you hear me speak and you think oh like man they must have had a bad season and we you know we won 29 right. games but your expectations is on the team that you have like we had high expectations so saying we fell a little bit short through competition is kind of part of it but it's also you know you're not going to grow as a coach unless you own your end of it how uncomfortable is it as a coach when you have young guards or have are these guys so advanced that they're Easing that a little yeah, bit. we're about ready to find out, like because I, I really like them. They, they've played well in practice. They've done some really good things, um, but we're also going against ourselves. So, like, how are they when we go against different people, different schemes, different things? I think they'll do well. Um, nobody's ever played college basketball and not struggled to yeah. some point. So you're going to have to, uh, you know, your learning curve is going to be when you struggle a little bit. You know, how can we use this in a positive fashion and get better? What's the next step for Zach here now that he's kind of amplified importance? at both ends of the floor? I, you know, first of all, he, he's got to be a dominant rebounder. You know, there's always the little things that we talk about, like what everybody needs to do. But it kind of starts there with him, like learning to communicate more, be more of a leader, but rebound the basketball, you know, demand the basketball, get deep position, and just keep leading by example. You know, the other areas will, you know, as long as you're on the court and the more you're on the court, it'll help you in those other areas. You keep talking about your front line. Obviously, it's much more than Zach. Uh, Correct. Just your ability to play a couple different ways, maybe, with Caleb and Trey, and just having all these different options now is something different, yeah, I guess. But with it, you know, things get lost. Like Mason Gillis is a yeah. really good piece for us, and, you know, he plays hard, he competes. Um, those other two guys, you know, have great size and they have great skill level, and uh, they, they both give us different looks. So, yeah, I'm excited about it. Like, without coming to with, like, like the absolute answer of who plays more together and all that, I think that organically takes care of itself. And, uh, but no, I think we have one of the best front lines in the country, you know, one through four, if, um, if not the best one. Because you know, there's no matter who comes off the bench, they're all, you know, not a lot of people are going to bring all conference caliber people off the bench. And when I think we'll do, no matter what we do, we will do that.
Experience unparalleled comfort, service, and cuisine at the Whitaker Inn. This Midwestern oasis is perfect for a relaxing staycation or weekend getaway. Escape from the ordinary at the Whitaker Inn. This is Alan Karpik, publisher of GoldenBlack.com. We couldn't be more excited to be joining the On3 network. We believe being part of the On3 network will provide the best user experience for all Purdue fans for years to come. And here's the good part. You can become a member for just a dollar for the first year. Our URL hasn't changed, so just go to goldenblack.com and sign up there. You're never going to have a better deal to be part of the largest Purdue community on the internet. The move to On3 is also an opportunity to work with the industry's best. On3 CEO Shannon Terry and the team he has assembled at On3 is beyond compare. So spend a dollar with us and we will work every day to provide you with something Golden Black has delivered over the past 33 years. And that is the most complete coverage of Purdue sports in the largest Purdue community that you will find anywhere. Kyle Chargers with Brian Newbert on Golden Black Radio previewing Purdue's 2022-23 basketball season uh, that will center a lot around the big man, Zach Eady. Brian Purdue uh, has had a, a bunch of <laughs> dominant big men over the Matt Painter era. You know, we could list them all off. I think everybody knows who they are. Z- Zach Eady has a chance to be – One of the best, if not the best, at least in terms of just the problems he causes. I mean, we have seen it in his first couple of years, obviously, with Purdue. But now, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, he does become, you know, sort of the guy now. And, you know, doesn't have to share the position at least as much, you know, probably could get a few more minutes there out on the court. How dominant do you think he can be in the Big Ten? Yeah, he can certainly be dominant. I mean, he can he can put up numbers that are just kind of one of one in college basketball this year on a per minute basis. I mean, that's what he's been doing. Um, whether he's been starting or coming off the bench, but he's been doing it in a timeshare. Now I, I, I do want to make this very clear. I, I, I don't think this is absolutely positively going to go from one of those deals where it's 20 minutes a game to 30 minutes a game to 35 minutes a game. Cause I don't, I don't think asking a guy that big to play that many minutes is, you know, the best uh, is a sure thing. Uh, I think that what you want from Zach Eady is you want those 20, 22, 20, 25 minutes, but you want them to be as effective as they can be. You want him to play at a really high level in that time. I think, you know, for as much as we're talking about Zach Eady not being in a timeshare anymore, I want to couch that in the fact that I think the Caleb Furs, Trey Kaufman, Ren combination coming off the bench in the front court, assuming they come off the bench together. I think can be really good together. And I I think can really give Purdue some flexibility, can really make Purdue problematic uh, in terms of having to guard those guys, but also being able to do some things differently defensively. So I don't want to say this is a situation where Purdue puts Zach E on the floor and leaves him there until he falls over. Um, They just need him playing the best minutes he can play, no matter how many of those are. But they do need him on the floor. They do need him staying out of foul trouble. They do need him in good shape things like that. They need those first five minutes of games to be really good. They need him to set a physical tone without fouling. That was a little bit of an uneven uh, theme uh, for him at times last year when he was still a young player. Uh, But I think that's especially important this year. But there's no reason why Zach Eady can't be a 18 and 10 uh, uh, sort of guy this year who takes a a, uh, a step from a defensive perspective who takes a step in the perspective of being a playmaker all offensively. He's never going to be Travion Williams as a passer. He's never going to be Caleb Swanigan as a passer. Mm-hmm. But he's going to bear a great deal of offensive responsibility on this team, and I think he's he's uh, probably up to it. But uh, he's going to draw a lot of attention, his ability to weaponize that attention uh, for other people. Uh, I, I think is going to be a really important key to produce success offensively, his ability to improve from a defensive perspective. Uh, I think is a big part of the solution for a team that has to get better defensively. And I, I think will simply because of focus, um, because I think this team is going to be a little more wired that way. So he is going to carry more responsibility than, you know, probably just about any player, uh, any single singular player Purdue's 
had during the Matt Painter era. And I, the only guy who comes to mind is Carson Edwards, but I always couch him with Ryan Klein because Ryan Klein did a lot of things too that, um, you know, were foundational for that team. Uh, but that team did an unbelievable job uh, kind of morphing into roles that really made Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein better and allowed them to do what they do. And he is going to need help from those around him in that regard. But he is, I, I think he's up to being one of the Big Ten's best players and Purdue's certainly going to need him to be. I think you put it a good way there. For me, the interesting part to watch here early in the season for Zach Eady is not so much the things that we have become accustomed to Zach Eady being able to do, get good position, score in the post, just dominate others, but how uh, how he's able to make the other players uh, in Purdue's lineup around him better. I think you use the phrase weaponize that attention for other people, which is a good way to put it, I think. You know, we know that Travion Williams, you know, probably one of the best passers, big men passers in, in Purdue history, maybe of all the Big Ten. Zach Eady's not going to be that, but he does need to be a guy who can get the ball in the post, and if the if the shot is not there for him or if the double or triple team comes, he is able to, to find others. Uh, he's been pretty good at that, but I think it's going to become even more acute now for him this year to be able to facilitate out of the post at times for others. Yeah, remember though, last we saw him, um, you know, he turned the ball over five times against St. Peter's for as much hell as Jaden Ivey catches for that game. Unfortunately, um, you know, that being his worst game of the season last year, you know, Zach Eady didn't didn't have his best his finest hour in that game either. <laughs> Purdue can't have they can't turn the ball over the way they turned the ball over last year. They're not talented enough to. They can't just score their way out of holes the way they could last season. Uh, at times, not always, but at times. Um, but some of Purdue's best offense historically, ever since they've been playing through a brontosaurus in the post, has come when opponents have double teamed them. Uh, and the ball has gotten moving. Purdue has shared the ball on the perimeter. Purdue has made that extra pass for a wide open three. Um, that falls on everybody now. But it starts with Edie, is when he gets that ball on the low block and a quick double comes. He's got to get it out of there. He's got to get it to the corner. Who's got? Who has to swing the ball to the wing? Who has to either take that shot, drive off the closeout, or move it to the top, or whatever it might be? Uh, he he's got to start the offense in that regard. He's got to make great decisions about you know scoring when he's got one guy on him, you know, uh, six inches from the rim, or getting the ball moving. Um, part of the reason people enjoyed Purdue's teams so much back when back when Vince Edwards, Dakota Mathias, and P.J. Thompson and those guys were on that team was because they shared the ball so much, so well. They, they passed the ball so well. Um, yeah. But what you have to understand, too, is those guys played like 100 games together to get to that point, and this team hasn't done that. So there's going to be some roughness around the edges, I think, um, in terms of the ball movement, stuff like that. Uh, Purdue likes its three-point shooting. They really like their three-point shooting, but outside of like Mason Gillis and maybe Caleb first, I think this team is almost entirely unproven uh, in terms of the shots they're going to be taking this year. Not necessarily as shooters, but in terms of the shots they're going to be taking this year because there's no more Jaden Ivey driving kick. There's no more Travion Williams, you know, dart to the to the backside corner for a, for a wide open three. You know, stuff like that. Guys are going to have to take different shots. You're going to have more guys running your actions. Um, but Purdue has to get to the point where uh, that ball is getting inside to Zach Eady. He's making the right read, and everything kind of flows out of that. Let's take another break. We'll come back. Your conversation with Zach Eady, the big man, coming up next. You're listening to Gold and Black Radio. When it comes to land sales, it pays to have experts in your corner. Acre Pro Midwest Farm Group is your local farmland specialist. With decades of experience in Indiana agriculture, no one knows the market better. Whether you're doing a 1031 exchange or simply buying and selling farmland, your local AcrePro agent will walk the land with you and ensure the deal is done right. Visit AcrePro.com or call 765-587-3185 to talk to your local land expert today. Again, 765-587-3185. It's got to start off just your expectations of the season and what you like about your team and what you think is going to define you guys this year. Well, I 
same expectations as always. You know, we just want to win basketball games. I don't think that changes throughout any year. You know, no team ever goes into the season and says, oh, man, it's, it, we lost some pieces. We're not going to be good this year. We're not going to mm-hmm. end. Like, we're we're going to expect just to win a lot of basketball games. Um, what was the second question? That was kind of it. But um, any kind of big picture focuses for you guys as a program kind of coming out of last season? Um, yeah, I mean, every team has their goals. You know, every team has the same goals every year. You know, Final Four, Big Ten title, um, Big Ten tournament title. I guess every team yeah. has the same goals. It doesn't matter who you have on the roster. Yeah. Just um, where does improvement come defensively, you think, this year? For me or for the team? For the whole team. Um, I think we have a lot of guys who are they're younger and kind of have that a lot of buy-in to, on that end. Um, we know that we kind of aren't the team that, like last year, where we can just outscore teams. You know, we're going to have to really grind games out. We're going to have to play really uh, well on that side of the ball. And that, kind of ha- that side of the ball has to be our de- identity going into next year. Right. Uh, from an offensive perspective, I know it starts with you and things like that, but what what do you like on paper about what you guys have from an offensive perspective? Everyone can shoot. Like Literally everyone besides yeah. uh, me and William have shot. Uh, 40% from three at some point in their career, whether it's high school or like last year. Yeah. So there's really no one on our team that you can say, oh, close up short, let him shoot. Like this, it's going to be, all, all time is going to be, I'm surrounded by four shooters mm-hmm. and four people that people need to respect on the perimeter. So, And that, that kind of puts an onus on your decision-making with the ball in the post, right? For Where sure. do you feel like you are now in terms of being an offense's key decision-maker in a lot of ways? Yeah, something, something I've been working on during this offseason, like just really honing on, on um Getting out, getting the ball out of my hands when double teams come, making the right read, um, making sure the ball doesn't get turned over when you look double team. Right, right. Um, just in terms of your stature on this team, you know, you've always had another guy with you, another really good big guy. Is it different for you at all? Is it is it pressure? Is it something you have to, you know, really be kind of locked in to handle, or how do you kind of view things? Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, I think that a lot of teams. When you go against me and Travion, you really, we could really get, we could have 40 minutes. Like we're gonna have 40 minutes of really good front court play this year as well. Like don't, don't get that mistaken. But it's different. Like last year, me and Travion, we really banged inside for 40 minutes, and the other team center, he would get, he would get some fouls. He would get to their backup centers. We would get to their backup backup centers sometimes. Yeah, right. um, and then when you get to that, a lot of teams don't have that type of depth. Um, and then also kind of. Even when I was sometimes in foul trouble, or when I wanted to have my best game, you know, Trey Brown, he could step up and he could fill that uh, role for the team. But this year, I'm going to have it's going to be on me to play well every game. Yeah, Matt still says he thinks you've got one of the best front lines in the country. That speaks volumes about Caleb and Trey, mm-hmm. and obviously Mason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's just um, it's definitely it's going to be different. Like, it's just, you're going to have me. I'm playing. I'm going to play inside. I'm going to um, like play with strength, play with mm-hmm. length. Um, and you have Caleb and Trey who can kind of, uh, you know, they're going to play on the perimeter. They're going to shoot the ball. They're going to they kind of take you off the dribble. And then you have Mason, who everyone knows what Mason's going to bring. You know, he's going to bring that toughness, rebounding. He's going to he's going to be super efficient from the field. He's not going to really turn the ball over. And he's going to make good decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything you guys have to do collectively to maybe help out your young guards a little bit as they kind of ease into things? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, just kind of providing them with feedback. You know, for me, Big thing has been like kind of teaching them how to like pass the ball inside, and teaching them how to feed the post because it's something that it might look easy when you want, look at watch it on TV, but it's really not. You know, you have to. There's certain keys that you have to really focus on. Certain timings of our plays. Right. You know, sometimes they'll catch the ball and they'll dribble instead of just catching the ball and looking right inside. So that's something Sasha for last year was really really good at. He was just really 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 good at feeding the post. Um, so it's just getting kind of getting them up to speed and. Uh, instructing them and constructively instructing them on kind of how to do that. Do you feel like an upperclassman now? I mean, you've, you've played two years. Do you feel like an older guy now as opposed to a, yeah, a younger guy? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I feel, you know, when I watch, when I look at some of the freshmen this year, I kind of, I, I remember what that was like two years ago. You know, it feels, when you're going through it, you never yeah. feel like an older guy. Like, you feel like I've just been here for a little bit longer than these other people because it's only been my third year, but it's just, I look at some of the freshmen, I look at some of the struggles they've gone through, and I kind of remember that, and I can sympathize with them um, because of that. Designing and building since 1968, TNW has changed the way people think about construction. TNW's three-stage approach to designing and building is unmatched throughout the construction industry. 
Learn more about TNW's people, passion, and projects at TWDesignBuild.com. This is Alan Karpik, publisher of GoldenBlack.com. We couldn't be more excited to be joining the On3 network. We believe being part of the On3 network will provide the best user experience for all Purdue fans for years to come. And here's the good part. You can become a member for just a dollar for the first year. Our URL hasn't changed, so just go to goldenblack.com and sign up there. You're never going to have a better deal to be part of the largest Purdue community on the internet. The move to On3 is also an opportunity to work with the industry's best. On3 CEO Shannon Terry and the team he has assembled at On3 is beyond compare. So spend a dollar with us and we will work every day to provide you with something Golden Black has delivered over the past 33 years. And that is the most complete coverage of Purdue sports in the largest Purdue community that you will find anywhere. Kyle with Brian talking a little bit of basketball before the Boilermakers get the exhibition season underway. Then the regular season should be a uh, intriguing one to say the least. I'm excited for it. Um, you know, Purdue's backcourt, Brian, has been you know much talked about. I think the point guard position um, is interesting because we spent so much time you know discussing what's going to happen at point guard, and then. Uh, Matt Painter very strongly says, hey, you guys need to watch out for this Braden Smith guy who for some reason was not ranked as highly as what he should have been. And and you're all going to find out soon, which are big words to say about a guy who has not yet played. But the fact that Matt Painter doesn't usually do that tells you that, you know, he feels strongly about his uh, freshman point guard. Do you feel better about the point guard position right now than uh, than what you did? I don't know. Before? Yeah, I, I think you feel better that you have one guy, whereas in the summer you worry that you had any guys. Um, but I think there's still two things that, you know, obviously bear mentioning. One is that Braden Smith has never played a college game. And, you know, I, I think there are things that made him successful at the high school level that he's going to have to kind of adjust to at the, at the college level, uh, as is the case with any freshman guard. But also you only have one of them. Uh, too. So the inexperience and the lack of depth are issues that are going to endure no matter how good Braden Smith is. Um, and I I think what you have to <laughs> hope for realistically from Braden Smith right away is that he's he's good, he's solid. Uh, you're not putting too much pressure on him to be, you know, Chris Paul right away. You know, stuff like that. Um, kind of let him ease into things insofar as you can when he's really your only guy at his position after that i think that uh you know it's it's kind of a committee deal you know purdue has systematically uh they've always kind of decentralized traditional like point guard responsibilities you can just look at the assist numbers over the years and understand that purdue's not kentucky purdue's not Michigan State, in terms of how much they rely on their point guard to be their primary, you know, playmaker, their their offensive engine, you know, kind of things like that. Um, really, the only absolutely pure point guard, uh, you know, painters really ever had at Purdue, in my opinion, was Lewis Jackson. You know, there have been combo guards left and right, the Keaton Grants, the uh, I consider P.J. Thompson more of a combo guard than a point guard, even though he was traditional point guard size. Eric Hunter was a combo guard through and through. Um, but they're going to run their offense through a lot of people, uh, and that's going to mean you know Fletcher Lawyer's a point guard at times. Ethan Morton is a point guard at times. David Jenkins is a point guard at times, even though none of them are players you would designate point guard as their primary position, uh, you know. Over the years, Purdue's run as much offense through Dakota Mathias as as and Ryan Klein and Carson Edwards mm-hmm. as, as pretty much anybody else out there. And that's those guys weren't, you know, quote unquote point guards. The year Purdue almost went to the final four, they were playing a power forward at point guard um in No Gel Eastern. So uh I, I think this is the year where you have to move a little bit of responsibility off that position even more. Uh but that being said, you know, I, I think you feel really good about what you have insofar as you can feel good about a freshman who's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. Uh, I think that the decision-making matters more than anything. I think the defense matters more than anything. Um, but I think Purdue feels really good about about Braden Smith, uh, both in the long term and, and the short term. You, you would just like to have 
you know, maybe a few more options there. You know, one guy that we haven't talked about a whole lot yet in the podcast is, is Brandon Newman, a guy who uh, I think Purdue fans and a lot of people have a lot of hope for uh, in sort of bouncing back from what was a very difficult season last year. I, I don't know that it's just quite as – I mean, I think we all want the storyline to uh, to sort of have this this great ending. I, I don't know that, that it's as easy as that, right, just, you know – jumping into the starting lineup and then suddenly uh, becoming the guy on the perimeter for Purdue. I, I think there's still a chance that some of the things that plagued him last year uh, plague him to some extent this year. Uh, but Purdue needs him to go out there and, and you know, be the guy that we saw in flashes a, a couple of years ago and, and maybe be that guy more consistently. What do you think Brandon Newman uh, can be? What do you think our expectation level should be for him? Yeah, I think that, Obviously, he's a good player. He's a talented player. He's he's shown that over the years. There have been some things that have 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 held him back a little bit on teams that were obnoxiously deep, yeah. Uh, too, and that's that may not necessarily be the case this year uh, in terms of Purdue's depth and the you know the restrictions that might come simply with everything around him. But I think it's been a process for him in terms of I don't want to say playing the game the way Matt Painter demands the game be played, uh, playing under control, you know, playing to his strengths, being disciplined and assignment oriented on defense, things like that. Um, there's no sense in litigating all of that stuff again, but uh, I think he's, he's, uh, I think he's been good this preseason. I think he's, 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 he's taken some steps forward. Uh, but I will also say that Purdue loves Fletcher lawyer. They love Fletcher Lawyer. And David Jenkins, while he doesn't have a lot of experience at Purdue, uh, has a ton of college experience. He's he's an adult. Um, yeah. Not that Brandon Newman isn't an adult at this stage of his career in his fourth year in the program, but David Jenkins has experienced everything in college basketball just about that you can you can experience outside of like a Final Four or like a, a, I was going to say a season being canceled due to a pandemic, but <laughs> <laughs> even the most outlandish example there. Yeah wouldn't apply um so i think he's he's got some work to do to get to that role where he's that 25 30 minute guy i don't know if that's a realistic thing um but i think he's gonna obviously uh be an important part of producing success this season whether that's the sort of uh you know top two score type of role that you might have figured he was in line for coming out of last season even though he didn't play a whole lot you know during the year um or if it's simply a uh, you know that that twenty minute role, whether that's as a starter or coming off the bench, either way, I think he's going to be a really important part of Purdue's success. I think you'll, I think he's got some real potential for this team because a they need people who can put the ball in the basket. B they need to be a really good shooting team, and that that jives with his skill set. Mm -hmm. C you need your experienced guys to play like experienced guys because experience is not something that is an abundant resource on this team. And then D kind of less tangibly. I think that I get that right. A, B, C, D. Yeah, I did. I would have gone with four on the last no, one. But is I couldn't remember if, if I was using numbers or letters. So <laughs> I, I got a little bit uh, sideways there. Um, this is kind of theoretical and, and, and random, but I think, you know, so many people, people in Mackey Arena are going to be rooting for Brandon Newman this year Yeah, that I think when he experiences success, if you were at that big 10 tournament game against Penn state, when he came off the bench and he helped them win that game, you could feel the energy he put into the Purdue crowd uh, because so many people were rooting for him. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've noticed as a guy who, who, who exists on social media, you know, th that's not, that's the exception as much as it's the rule nowadays. Like, got, fans are, are rooting for the players to do well, but not overtly. You know, it, it, it's not the most supportive, coddling, yeah. cultivating environment these days. So when you see a crowd that is like 100% in unison behind being invested in a player's success, that's a pretty neat thing. And I think because of the experience he had last year, uh, I think people are going to, you know, really root for him uh, this year. And when he experiences success, I think that is something that can energize the crowd. And in turn, that can energize 
team. And I think this is a team with so little experience and so many new parts. Every little bit helps. Yeah, it's crazy. You can put up a Newman Seinfeld gift. That's it. And you'll get yeah. a couple hundred likes out of it. Just, just because I, I sort of equate it. It's almost like uh it's almost like a walk-on mentality with a guy who was a what it was a four-star recruit. I mean, everybody loves the walk-on, right? Coming off the bench at the end of the game. That's not at yeah. all what Brandon Newman is, but it has the same sort of universal feel um for for in this case, Purdue fans, but for fans rooting for a guy, you just don't see that, as you point out, very often with highly recruited players. I mean, right. even, well, I even think like a Jay Nivey, great player, uh, a once in a generation type player to come to Purdue, divisive in some respects among the fan base, which is just crazy to me. But to yeah, have- but I, I think you have to separate social media hot takes and like real life. Too, I, I, I think you know. I think generally people understand that Jaden Ivey was one of the best, most talented players to ever come through Purdue's program. That he was still developing on the fly, and people took their frustrations out on him quite often. Unfortunately, because the expectation of great players is to be great all the time, and yeah. it, it sometimes it's lost sight of that these these people, these players, are growing up in front of your eyes. You know, they are young people, and you know. There are processes involved with players becoming what they're supposed to be. And I think that's part of the reaction to Newman, too, is I think he maybe gets the reaction that the plucky little walk-on might, um, who's trying really hard, because people understand, hey, this is a talented kid. He was this four-star recruit. I think we would all process basketball and college sports much better if just the rankings just came off the table as soon as a guy enrolled in school, because the standards sometimes guys get held to because of that, um, you know, shape the way people perceive them, uh, that, that there's no way around that. We're in the rankings business. So I'm not being a hypocrite by I, saying that I hope, but I think when people react to Brandon Newman, the way they did it in that Penn state game, I think what they're doing is they're seeing the light come on that they've been waiting to come on that they saw flicker mm-hmm. a lot his his redshirt freshman year when he was brilliant some games and then typically followed the, the, those games up by not being so brilliant i think people have just been waiting for that light to come on so any and stay on and i think when he shows that that might be happening i think people get excited and i think the human story of him of people watching him struggle you know i i think you know, I, I, I'm i going to use this as an example. I think part of the reason people really connected with Robbie Hummel at Purdue was mm-hmm. because his struggles were laid bare. You know, he was – people saw him on his some of his worst days, and they connected with that. I, I think that was something that, you know, really resonated with people. And I think people saw Brandon Newman struggle last year. People know how ambitious Brandon Newman is, how much he wants to be good. And seeing him during games, not getting off the bench, I think people realized, hey, this is real. That is that that is a young person who wants something much different for himself, who's got to be going crazy right now. Um, and I think the fact that he came out after the season and basically said, I'm going to make this right. I'm staying. I'm not leaving. When it's so easy to leave nowadays, yeah. I think that that just speaks to people as humans as much as it does basketball fans. Yeah, we got a little deep yeah. there, didn't we? Yeah, well, yeah, it, it, it did, but uh, I think it's true. I think a lot of what you said is uh, is accurate about uh, Brandon Newman, and certainly a reason why everybody is pulling for him. Purdue will open its exhibition season on on Wednesday. Brian, uh, your projected starting lineup. I'll give you mine. I think we're probably similar here. I would imagine they'll go Smith, Newman, Morton, Gillis, Edie for uh, the exhibition. You think? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at a toss up between Newman and lawyer. Uh, I, I have no idea. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we're recording this before the close scrimmage against Cincinnati. So, uh, I, I will know more by the time Sunday rolls around, but that'll be completely irrelevant to the conversation we're having right now. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I think that it's 50 50 between Newman and lawyer. Again, they love lawyer. They love yeah. Fletcher lawyer. Uh, it's not to say they don't love Brandon Newman, but, um, I just think they're so invested in Fletcher lawyer. I, I think he's going to get every opportunity to claim a really big role for Purdue. Um, but Brandon Newman has experience and we've talked so much about the, and he's done well. It's not like he's turned into a pumpkin this, this, this preseason. He's been, he's done well, whether he's all the way where, you know, Purdue would love him to be that. I don't know that I'm also probably not qualified enough to even say whether he is or not. Um, I assume Mason Gillis starts at the four. Uh, Purdue has three starters at that position, basically. Yeah. Three starter caliber players at that position. So that one is maybe a little bit uh, up in the air. I think it's Gillis be simply because he has so much – well, A, he's a good player. And B, what he does – I'm doing the numbers to letters thing again. Um, what he does is so valuable to this team. Uh, but also he has so much experience playing alongside Zach Eady and – it is imperative that the guys around Zach Eady this year make Zach Eady a better player. And Mason Gillis stretches the floor with his three-point shooting. He doesn't get in Zach Eady's way by needing the ball around the basket. Uh, he doesn't need the ball, period, to be productive. You don't want to take touches necessarily away from the guy you're built to give touches to. Um, and he's just experienced. He knows how to get the ball inside. He's a great entry guy. I think he's the best complement to Eady of those three guys. But then on the on the flip side of that, I think first and Trey Kaufman ran really can be that to one another too. I think the the high low, the inside out kind of dynamics offensively that can come with Caleb first to the five, Trey Kaufman ran at the four, or uh that flipped, I think can be really, really uh potent for Purdue. Starting now, I, I think Purdue can be really hard to guard in a much different way. I think together they give you an opportunity to play a very different style of basketball. Then you're playing with Zach Eady on the floor. And I think tethering those guys together, Eady and Gillis, and then first and Kaufman ran as much as you can. Now, you, there's no way around Caleb first playing next to Zach Eady, Trey Kaufman ran playing next to Zach Eady, Mason Gillis playing next to Caleb first. There's no way around those combinations existing. But I think the more you can tether those two man groups together, I, I think that gives you a lot of opportunities to maximize your personnel the best way possible. Yeah, certainly will be exciting to watch to see how all of that develops. Brian, I think it should become your thing. You should count things off in Roman numerals. I, I, I. I, V. That's I, four, I, right? I, I, V, 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 I. It should, it should just become your thing. That'd be great. Yeah. Super Bowl uh, <laughs> XX111, which is what? That would be 23. Like 23? X is 10, 23. right? I don't know. Yes. X, X, is, X 10. is 10. V is 5. 1 is 1. L is something. And if you put the 1s in front of the larger numeral, that's subtraction. If you put them behind, that's addition. All right. We're off track. This will surely... You learn something. Surely, this will surely... If you didn't know you. how to use Roman numerals... This will... You know what they should do? <laughs> if... You know, everybody gets so excited about new uniforms, Right. Yes. Fans love new uniforms. They yes. live no for doubt. new uniforms. I, I, I've i never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> if a college program really wanted to be new and innovative and really stand out, yeah. let's go with the Roman numerals on the back. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. There you go. This last uh, two minutes of this podcast are, are most certain to sell you new subscriptions on the new website. There's no doubt about it. One dollar for a oh. year. Uh, <laughs> Purdue, uh, goldenblack.com now on, on the on three sports network, um, goldenblack.com's URL still works. Go there, sign up. Uh, I will do everything in my power the next 12 months to give you your 100 pennies worth of product. <laughs> um, yeah. we don't think you'll be disappointed in the platform in, in, in the content, in the, in the entertainment, um, in the Roman numeral talk, <laughs> whatever it might be. Go check us out, people, please. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. No problem. All right, that'll do it for the podcast. If you do like the podcast, and hopefully you do, rate us five stars in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to leave us a comment as well. We do appreciate that. Appreciate our sponsors also. And uh, 
thanks again to the time of, of Matt Painter and Zach Eady for being on this podcast as well. For Brian Newbert, I'm Kyle Charters. Thanks for listening. This is Gold and Black Radio.